w one of the things that I really um, like, I was, I was fascinated with the speech as well, and loved hearing every every bit of it. Bit of it because fairness of endearment to me was oh god, it was the vindication, it was the um, it was the awakening, it was. You know, you know, sometimes in your career when you're, you're trying to be the leader that you know you should be and a lot of things are pointing to there's a different way. People are showing you there's a different way that you should be doing management science, a different way of looking at productivity, a different way of managing performance, a different way of development, a different way of running your business. And then when you look at firms of endearment, there's empirical proof. There's empirical proof about what true leadership can be, what values can be, about consciousness. And to me, it was, it was really an eye-opener. And I've read a lot of books and done a lot of courses that I got nothing out of. But with this one, it was a, a, a page turner, like an absolute page turner. And I think I've read it now maybe four times because sometimes, you know, in your darkest hours when you're thinking, Shit, maybe I have got it wrong, you read through and you go, no, no, it, it is right. I am right. But I wanted to start off with um, talking about servant leadership and also talk about higher purpose. But I think one of the things that to me was one of the most fascinating things is two of the most, I suppose, important or influential leadership traits, skills, values that I learned actually came from when I wasn't a leader or I wasn't a manager. It actually came from when I was in the police force. And I know it won't, you won't think it to look at me because this was about 20, 25 years ago. I'm, I look young, I know. But 20, 20, um, 20, 25 years ago in New Zealand and the police force, I learned two key critical things around leadership. And the first one was one of those experiences that I always remember that, that um, cartoon where you've got the kitten with all the porcupine quills and it says, why the hell is it that experience is always here? It was one of those type of experiences. And so when I was in the police force, I was, one of the jobs that we used to have, especially in New Zealand, was we would be called in to go and um, ask gentlemen if they'd like to leave the premises. Now, in New Zealand, we didn't have guns, and there would be two of you that would walk in. One of you would ask the gentleman to leave, the other one was there in case all hell broke loose. Now, I was a young cop, I was maybe 19, 20. We'd walk into the pub. Every time my partner did it, I would never really hear what he'd say, but we'd walk in. Whoever it was that we were going to ask to leave the pub would look at him, he'd look at me, we'd look around, we'd walk out. Things are done, we'd be standing outside, we're all friends and everything's great. Every time I did it, there'd be a fight through the bar, over the bar, through the ceiling, out the window. And it was painful. <laughs> and I remember looking at this guy and I'm thinking, how the hell? And so I was the, the young bloke, I was 19, 20. And he was really old. He must have been at least 30, 35. <laughs> and I, I said to him a couple of times, why is it you walk in, whatever you say, you walk out. I walk in, all hell breaks loose. And he, it's, this is deadly serious. He looked at me and he said, I'm not telling you. Not yet. And I thought, oh, you know, one of these days I'm going to get my head taken off, but no, that's cool. If it's the time it isn't yours, you know, I, I can work through this. <laughs> and this went on for <laughs> months. But then we got to a point where he actually said, no, I, I, yeah, do you know what it is? And I said, no, I honestly have no idea. Because he wasn't a big guy, he didn't, like, do that. It was, how come they pick on me, they don't pick on you? You know, we're going and we're going to be doing this. And he looked at me and he said, you're an idiot. <laughs> Similar to some of the advice that you got. And he said, you know, where's the respect? Where's the honourable way? And it hit me like, like a thunderbolt. It was the fact that when he walked in, what I didn't realise was he was giving that person an honourable way. He would go in, they'd have a quiet word, how about we leave, you know, we both walk out, you know, and the rest of the rhetoric. Whereas with me, I was going in, thinking, right, you're coming out, chest puffed up, come on, let's do this thing. I backed him into a corner. No respect, no honourable way out. 
And the second I started thinking about respect, the th second I started thinking about giving somebody an honourable way, changed the way that I was as a cop from, from that day forward. That's one that I think has stayed with me right throughout my career, and it's one that I want to come back to in terms of servant leadership. The other one is about higher purpose. And the one thing that I couldn't work out is I used to, as a cop back then, we weren't paid much. It wasn't particularly good circums. You know, the, the, the environment wasn't particularly that, well, especially for me kicking guys out of bubs, wasn't that friendly type of environment, but I loved it. I couldn't wait to go to work. And in, in roles that past that, I couldn't understand why I couldn't get the same connection. And it was about doing something that matters, doing something that is going to help someone. It's about that higher purpose. It's about doing something that at the end of the day, you can walk away and go, you know what, I did that. Um, so then if you fast forward, I did, a, I did a few different roles, so paramilitary, so my view on leadership then was I wore a uniform, I saluted, I got balled out, I put my hands down like that, saluted, balled out, hands down like that, and you know, the old fellas showed you what to do. Then I, was, uh, I did some time as a bodyguard, I was a commercial diver, did a few other things, then got into leadership. And that was when I joined financial services. Now, that was maybe 20, 25 years ago, so I've spent a lot of time in financial services. And one of, the, one of the things that I really struggled with when I joined was I thought that in the police force I'd seen some bureaucracy and I'd seen some autocracy. And I thought that when I was um, you know, knocking around with commercial divers and when I was knocking around in terms of bodyguard that I'd you know, seen some guys that want to try and you know, act pretty tough. Again, I hadn't seen anything until I joined financial services. And the reason, the reason I say that is it may resonate with some people here. I'm not sure what industry or which role you've had. But when I joined out, for the first long while, I didn't think I fitted the suit. Because what I saw in terms of performance management was somebody should be leaving in tears. Somebody should be getting strips ripped off them. Somebody should be getting angry. Somebody should be caught, caught, hauling someone over the coals. In terms of position, you know, it was where you sat. It was how you sat. It was what was going through. How many times do you knock on the door before you walk through? Do you do a bow or a curtsy if it's a senior exec? Whatever. And I think one of the challenges that I had going through was you know that that's wrong. You know that what you're try to do, about respect, about servant leadership, about actually being there for your team, putting them before yourself. So as I was going through a lot of this and, and challenged, and I think I went through a whole lot of different emotions about from a career point of view, then, like I say, it was only a few years ago I left Red Firms of Endearment, and it was this huge vindication. You know, it was empirical. And up until then, you know, I'd found other people that led in a similar vein, they spoke a similar sort of language, but there were very few and far between. I mean, it's changed, I think, over the years, and you're starting to see, you know, as, as endearment talks to, you know, the age of transcendence, you know, going from material things to, the, to those of meaning. Now, for me, it's a journey that I, I just get so fired up and so passionate about. Because the more that we can, the, the more that we, as a, as a, it, it, I think leaders should be a profession, but the more as, as our vocation or as what we do, we move to the conscious realms and we go into consciousness, the greater returns it's going to be for everyone in terms of it, society, community, etc. Um, and I wanted, wanted to just give a couple of really quick um, examples. And one was almost a direct take from uh, both Mark and, and listening this morning about when you look at somebody as being a whole person. I don't know if uh, people here are from large organisations or small organisations, but what you find when you work for large organisations, and this is over the years, a lot of things become tick a box routine. Have you had a development discussion? Yes, I have. Well, how do you know that? Well, I've ticked these three box 
So what did you do? Well, I went through, how good are you at your job? I need you to be better, so I ticked the box. And it, it does, and then it becomes this, and before you know it, you're on the same damn treadmill because you're asking, does he report to you, did you tick your box? How many boxes are ticked? You know, have you developed people as their you know, appropriate boxes being ticked? You know, do we do that right the way through? You go back, do, you know, are you looking about the whole person? Are you sitting with them saying, where do you want to be? What do you want to be? You know, if, it may not be working with me, but what can I do to help to develop you so that you can be fulfilled in your role? How can I help to develop you so that you can go and do more, greater, better things? How can I develop you so that you become better than me and I can report to you ultimately? Um, and it's the exact same as performance management. And if you think, how many people here, if you go back over your career, have seen those horror stories of performance management sessions. I mean, I've witnessed and I have seen and I have heard people talk about them and they're just horrific. You know, the, the, you know somebody's got to be crying, somebody's got to be tough, somebody's got to be doing whatever. And I think, again, we've been brought along a road where we're so worried about the legal implications, we're so worried about how do you address to make sure you've got the right boxes ticked, how do you know that you've made sure you've followed the right rate criteria, routine, the productivities where it should be, et cetera, et cetera, that we depersonalize and we forget it's the whole person. And that's where I, I've unfortunately parted company with a lot of different people over 25 years. There's not one that I couldn't have a coffee or a beer with because there's not one that's ever been the wrong person. It's only ever been the wrong, the wrong match. You know, and if you sit with somebody and say, oh, I don't understand, help me with, with, with through me on this, I've never ever found it where it wasn't that somebody's doing a job they don't want to be doing, they're not passionate about it. They haven't found that meaning, they haven't found that reason to be with you. And what I've found is if you think and just take those two things, just in terms of when you develop someone, if you develop them as the whole and develop what they want to be, not what you need them to be for you, and when you performance manage someone, there's always immediately the negative connotation, but when you're doing it, are you actually talking about, you know, what's the fit like? Are you enjoying it? Are you fulfilled? Is there a satisfaction? Are you engaged? Is this something you want to be doing? How do I change that? How can I change the role, change the approach? Because God, you know, as Mark said, if, if everybody was fulfilled and everybody was engaged, God, what couldn't you do? And I think from where I sit, in um, and, and my career to date, the one thing that I wanted to, to get across is that going through this, I mean, I, I, I giggled when we were talking about, uh, Mark was talking about some of the old style leadership. I was here and in a role when they were talking about time and motion studies. Does anybody remember those? You had an index of how long does it take to lift a coffee cup from the desk to your mouth. I've read it. You know, it was the draconian thing where they used to say productivity, uh, dollars equaled productivity. The way to get it done is eradicate those movements. You know, how long does it take to do a hip joint to the, you know, how far we've come and how good it is. But it's, as I went through all of that, the one thing is, you know, you've got to, my, my value would have been integrity. You've got to be true to you. You've got to be true to the leader you are. You've got to be true to your own values. And sometimes it's despite what you'll be told, the influences that'll come down on you, the rationale that'll come across, whether it be down, sideways, upwards, analysts, whatever. You've got to be true to yourself. I once got asked if I could put a definition to what integrity is. And my, the closest I can come to is, you know what? It's what happens when nobody would ever know. You know, it's not the stuff you do when people can see. It's the stuff that you do where you could do whatever and no one will ever know. You do the right thing then, that's integrity. Um, and I think the last, the last point that I wanted to talk to was the ability to be able to develop yourself. Like, oh, I'd love to say I'm a great leader, but I'm not. You know, it's, God, you strive, you try, I've done 25 years trying to be a good leader. I'm not there. I'm hoping, I'm praying that one day I'll get close, but who knows. 
But one of the key vital things that I've found, and the one thing that I think as a leader you have to do, you've got to be prepared to look in the mirror. And the only way you can look in the mirror, and the only one that's going to let you know what you like as a leader, is your team. And I wanted to share something with you. Everyone's done 360 degree feedback where your team will tell you, you know, everything. I'd, I'm going to put this out there but I, with a warning. I tried something recently, maybe six months ago, with uh, my team. And rather than do a 360, you know, where it's like, you know, everyone thinks, oh, yeah, he's a nice guy, and, you know, I'll well, put this down or whatever. I actually went out and said, okay, I want you to answer four, four questions. What am I not good at? How have I let you down? How have I not assisted in your development? And what would you do if you, you were given my development plan? And I got an independent to ask the questions, and I said, I don't want to hear anything good. I just want to hear constructive. Now, we were talking about self-actualizing, and I've done a lot of feedback over the years. When that feedback came in, and it was six or seven pages, man, that was the hardest. I went through every emotion humanly possible. The bastards, I should quit, how could they, what have I done, oh my God. But now, maybe three or four months later, I've settled down and I can actually talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but the key things was I got two key call outs that came through so clearly that I've now addressed, well, or I'm yeah, trying to address. If I, had, if I had asked the questions, I wouldn't have got the feedback. If I hadn't got the feedback, I couldn't have answered it. If I couldn't have answered it, I couldn't keep developing as a leader. But with that, I just honestly warn you, I went through every emotion from, well, yeah, like I say, now I can talk about it in public before it was whimpering in the corner. Um, but just going back, with Mark, if you get the chance, Firms of Endearment, you've got to read it. It's the it's, it's the most amazing validation of what you do, why you do it. And just stay true to it, you know? Don't let outside external pressures change who you are and the leader you could be and what you develop. So, thank you. That was awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Questions? There we go. Gary? Thanks for revealing your vulnerability <laughs> as your strength. The, the last points you made really interested me. In what you learned in that 360 evaluation, what were some of the insights that you came up with in digging deep into all those emotions? Well, yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> if I start sobbing, please go with me on this one. Um, <laughs> I'll be really, really honest because, I mean, that's what we're talking about. One of the things that came through was I always talk integrity uh, and ex excuse the language, but I always say across uh, our company, we will not prostitute. And by that I mean we won't sell out, we won't trade, we won't go past or beyond anything. And so what happens is by... The virtue of the fact that I'm always talking about integrity and I have my own value system and I won't do this and I won't do that, what I hadn't realised is sometimes if you're so strong in terms of my ideals, my values are right, therefore everybody else's is wrong, so therefore if you come anywhere near me and you're not 100% aligned to what I'm saying, then I'll discount you or you don't exist on my planet or... It's, it's almost that what I've done by trying to live my life and, and do my career with integrity, I've actually pushed people away that may, their values may, we may be aligned, but you would never know because I put this ironclad, I will not cross this line. But what's coming back is over the years, maybe lines change, maybe things move, maybe you should be prepared to discuss, to talk through. And it's, it was hard, you know, it's a really hard thing to come to terms with. But that, that was just one. But it took a long time because my immediate reaction was, no, I won't sell it, I'm not looking at it, that's not going to happen. But then it's coming back and saying, well, you know, I've got to go back, I've got to challenge myself. Down there, Chelsea. Hi, Phil. 
Oops. Mark here. Um, you talk about integrity. How do you balance that with um, difficult corporate messages? So we hear a lot about productivity, cost cutting, and things like that, which is not easy always to have integrity when you're delivering that message when it could mean people's jobs within your own team. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Mark, do you want to take... <laughs> no, I th I, look, I... <laughs> that, that's such a good question. And I think, you know, we all have to go through situations where it's almost the corporate lie. You can go and talk to a team and you know that at some point that team may be made redundant because of a merger and acquisition, a, a, whatever, for whatever reason. I always go, there are two things that I do. I always go as far as humanly possible with what I know that I can be comfortable to live with, to, to talk to. And if it steps outside of that, then I've got a challenge. I, I can't... Um, yeah, I, I can't live with myself if I am to say something that is a direct lie. So it's a matter of if it's, um, if it is that example, so somebody's going to be made redundant, how do you not tell them? I go back on experience. Over 25 years, the amount of times I've gone and said to somebody, sorry, your team's gone, and then the next week we get bored. Somebody else buys it. It's never final until it's final which is what I always go through in terms of my own mind. I've been so wrong so many times by calling something before it happened. But I personally, there is a line that I'll never cross. And if it means changing roles, changing jobs, then that's what it would be. But it's never easy. I struggle with that a thousand percent. And I think sometimes we work out ways of, of saying what needs to be said without breaching a, a, a confidentiality. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Phil, Chelsea? Hi, Phil. Chelsea Ford. That was a very humbling and courageous act you took with asking your team for feedback. <laughs> How, you know, you weren't in a self-help group whilst you did it. <laughs> 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 and you alluded to some feelings coming up. I just would like to hear some real practical ways you, you dealt with all that and how you went back to being their leader because I imagine that happened probably from one day to the next. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting actually. Like, my team helped me through it a lot and um, because it, it, to be completely honest, my team didn't like me doing it. They were forced to say things they didn't really want to go to that end. So a lot of what I found was, was I got so much respect for my team. They, they came to me saying, you know, you've got to put things in context and this is why you said whatever. And I'm trying not to let it show. But you know, I've been accused of wearing my heart on my sleeve. And I think sometimes you can't help. But if you're depressed or you've been let down, you, you look it. Um, but a lot of, I think, also stepping back and going, okay, so I asked this for a reason. What was the reason I asked for? I didn't ask anyone to tell me what, what, you, what do you think I do well or what do you think I you know, could really exploit. I said, what don't I do well? And it's, if you do it, the, the thing is you've got to be able to feed it back to your team. You've got to be able to say, what am I going to do about it? And sometimes you've got to say, well, suck it up, soldier. You're not as good as you thought you were. What am I going to do to be better? And I think that the, the sooner you get out of that whole victim mentality, which is where I was going with it, and it's like I should give up, I should give it away. How can I be a leader if people think that you know, my values aren't aligned or whatever it is? To be able to say, okay, well, I've just got to go into that real place of reflection and say, so what did I always want to be as a leader? And how do I want to address going forward so that I can be the leader I wanted to be? How do I address that to really take it one step forward? And spend a lot of time talking to my team. You know, and really going through with them and saying, okay, so if I do this, this is what I intend to do, but you've got to help me. You've got to you know, steer me in the right direction. If I go off course, you've got to bring me back online. Um, and bourbon. But it was, I think the team, you know, if, if you're open and if you really feed back and let them feed to you, 
your team help you so much. They really do. Sorry, have I gone over time? Nope. Uh, Zaki? Oh, yeah. All right, Pinchot. Hi there. <coughs> you talked about value and integrity. Uh, to me, value is not absolute. Uh, many times, those values are contextualized with not just yourself, but your environment. Yeah. And especially in our country, where we have got such a multiculturalism, where people come from different contexts, uh, the same value, like simple value, like integrity, could be deciphered, interpreted quite differently. How do you manage in a workforce which is so diverse in their cultural background, yeah. where you try to bring a unified one definition of a particular value? Yeah. Um, I, again, the, the, the team that I work with is, is amazing. And it's making sure you play to all of our strengths. And one of the things that we've always said, whenever we get together and we have a meeting, it's not, it's not your right to dissent, it's your duty. So just because I say it doesn't mean it's right. Hell, it's probably, you know, if everybody agrees, you may not have heard me properly. It's, it's got to be challenged. You've got to be able to fight through those, those positions. And if you look at the collective expertise, if you look at the collective value, if you look at the collective experience that you've got in your own leadership team, th there is just a wealth. There is nothing you can't achieve as that team. But it means each one of you has to be prepared to absolutely challenge. And so when we look for it, it's always coming from that whole point of integrity. So if we, if we want to bring values together, if we want to do and make sure that we've got that unity right the way across where there is full engagement and full integration, then it's got to be the whole team prepared to challenge and, and do what it takes to, to maintain it. Um, but again, it's always that challenge. It's always that challenge. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the team. It's, it's the team and it's asking those within the teams. You know, it's, I was saying, as, you know, as Mark alluded to before, if you look at uh, a book I love, First Break All the Rules, which is done by Gallup, you know, a lot of what they talk to is, you know, the, the difference between satisfaction and fulfillment. You know, there, there are things which are hygiene factors, so that if you don't have it, you'll be dissatisfied. If you have a lot of it, it doesn't mean you'll be satis uh, satisfied, it just means you won't be dissatisfied. So when you go for the fulfillment, there should be uh, in there around respect. Do I feel like I've been developed? Do I feel like I've respected? Does my voice matter? Does my voice count? And making sure you've got that right the way across. Um, I mean, have we got it right? No, I don't think so. God, we're working at it. And it's, um, you know, again, it's trying to get it, get it to where it should be. That's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.